together, church, and get our hearts prepared for worship. It is the Christmas season.
lift it up. You make all things beautiful. Christmas. You got your decorations up? As you can tell, some of us know. Hey, as you can tell, we are ready here at the Avenue. We got trees everywhere. So many opportunities to take some pictures, right, moms? Yeah. Hey, I love, I love this time of the year because I love getting on social media and seeing all the different pictures. And here's what I want to challenge you to do. As you're walking through campus and you see all the photo ops, take a picture, put it on social media and tag it Advent at the Avenue. We want to use those pictures. We want to put it up on social media. So do that this week, all right? Also, we want you to know this is a time of the year that we believe uh, new faces are going to walk through this door, and we need more volunteers to help greet and welcome them as they come in. So if you're not part of a team here after the service, go jo uh, join up with uh, our team over in the Hub, and they will hook you up with an opportunity to serve. Hey, listen, uh, this is a special time for us as we go into this Advent season, and uh, we believe as a church, this is an opportunity for us to slow down and really think about the things that we're thankful for. And so y'all check out this video. China has identified the cause of the mysterious new virus. Coronavirus. Coronavirus. This is a rapidly emerging situation. Where there is not a cause for alarm. The first U.S. case has been detected. simply means to await the arrival of something special. And for generations, Christians all around the world would gather together and, and think about why this, re, uh, this season is so special. They would uh, pray together. They would read scripture together. They would light these candles as a way to remember the season. And here at the Avenue, starting today, we're going to kick things off. And it's, I'm so excited. Here's the thing. 
Maybe you've never participated in Advent before. Hey, we're doing this together. We're going to have everything provided for you. From the youngest all the way to the oldest, we're going to celebrate Advent on Sunday mornings. But we're also going to encourage you to take it home with you through guided readings and prayers and through the traditional Advent lighting of the candles like you saw in the video. Here, here's what we're asking for you from you is that you would pick one day out of the week to gather with your family, whether that's at dinner or maybe family time, and just sit and think about what it is we have truly to be thankful for. We're going to have these Advent kits for purchase out in the lobby for five bucks. Run by there, grab that. It's going to be a special time, and we want you to join us on this journey this season. Hey, listen, uh, this, this particular day, we are talking about hope. And I know during this season where it's difficult, it's hard for us to sometimes see what we have hope in. And so as we head into this next time of worship, I'm going to ask you to stand and we're going to pray real quick. God, we love you and we trust you. And God, right now, as we head into this time of worship, as we uh, talk about hope, God, I know that difficult times we often miss uh, the things that we have hope, hope in, God, and that's you. God, your word says that we should fix our mind and our hearts on the things above and not on the things of earth. And that's what we hold on today. We fix our eyes on you. God, we love you and we trust you. It's in your sons and we pray. Amen. Let's continue in worship.
mess of this life, there's one thing that remains the same. There's one constant, and that is the hope that is found in the name of Jesus. You believe that this morning, church? Amen. Let's continue to sing about that. There is a song I know it well, a melody that's never fell on mountains high and valleys low. My soul will rest my confidence in you alone. Hope has a name. My Savior's cross has set the sin in free hope has a name. His name is Jesus. Oh Christ be praised. I have victory. Thank you, Jesus. Welcome to Avenue Church. Thank you so much for joining us. I thank you for being in the room. Uh, those of you in Ennis, thank you for joining us there. Online, 
we're overwhelmed at how many of you are joining us online. We know a lot of you don't even live in Ellis County. And so what we're asking you to do in the comments, let us know where you're from. We just like to get a handle on where our family has spread out all over the place. So just let us know that you're here. It is Christmas time at the Avenue, and it looks like a Christmas store threw up everywhere. It's incredible. If you can't be here, those of you online, everywhere you look in both campuses, it's just Christmas. It's just Christmas trees and just decorations. And they did a great job of making you truly feel the Christmas season here in the room and, and in and both campuses. And you know, if you've been a part of the Avenue or been connected with us for very long, we're not real traditional. The things we do are not like a lot of churches. We don't really follow a lot of traditions. Our campuses are not designed like normal churches. I get all the time, you know, where, where are the crosses, where are the crosses, where are the crosses? I get that. I understand. But we did everything we did on both of our campuses on purpose. We do it on purpose because we're a church that wants to cater to the first-time guest, to the person who's never entered a church building, or to the person who is a little, uh, you know, afraid of going into a church building and doesn't like it. So we do that on purpose. Our worship style is not real traditional. And you've seen that. You've experienced that from all of the different music that we do and just all of the things. We're not real traditional. But when Christmas comes, we kind of get traditional. Because isn't it a great time to pull out the nostalgia? And what it does for us, it reminds us that we are a part of a tradition that has been going on for thousands of years. We are part of a rich heritage because Jesus came into this earth and changed everything, and he changed everything in such a way that churches have been celebrating what they call the Advent. Advent is a Latin word that just means arrival. And since 480 AD, the church has gathered together to celebrate the arrival in three different perspectives. The first thing we celebrate in the Advent, the arrival, is the birth of Jesus. And we celebrate it at Christmas time. And no, he probably wasn't born on December 25th. In fact, no, he was not born December 25th. But, you know, my dad grew up his whole life, and he celebrated his birthday on April 17th. Uh, he joined the military and found out he was actually born on April the 27th. It didn't affect him any. It doesn't affect us as we celebrate Jesus on December 25th. That's the first thing we celebrate. That's what Christmas is about. But the church also celebrates every week the fact that Jesus can arrive in the heart of an unbeliever. Jesus can come into our lives. He can give us a new life. He can adopt us into the family of God. And that can happen any day from the first arrival to the third perspective, the, the second arrival of Jesus. And so at the Avenue, we really celebrate that second arrival of Jesus into individuals' hearts on a weekend basis. And the Avenue exists to make you comfortable so you can hear the good news. And so the Advent, the arrival can happen in your life. And then that third one, the second coming. We're excited about the second coming because that's when Jesus is going to set everything right. That's when everything is going to be put back the way it was before sin entered the world. That's when we're going to be in perfect relationship with God and perfect relationship with each other. That's something to look forward to, not to fear. And so we have the Advent, and we want to celebrate that with you. We want you to celebrate it in your family, and we're going to go through all of those things, understanding what it means to have these three perspectives of the arrival of Jesus in our life. Now, some of you are familiar with Advent. You grew up in traditions, and this was your tradition, and you Ennis folks, Catholic folk, Advent, you, got no, you could teach us about Advent. We get it. And so you can look at these candles, and there's all these different perspectives of how you can preach the Advent message. But because of 2020, we've decided to focus on hope, joy, love, and peace. Anybody agree that that was a good choice? In this season and everything we've been through, wouldn't it be nice to hold on to hope? Wouldn't it be nice to have a little joy? Wouldn't it be nice to have peace and then, of course, love? We live in a horrible, horrible, divided time, don't we? I mean, everybody is mad at everything. As a pastor of a church, I mean, I spend my entire last eight months of my life making people angry. I've learned that there's nothing I can say. If you've noticed, I am off social media because I can't say anything without ticking about 80% of you off. 
And so there's nothing we can do in this time because there's so much turmoil, there's so much division, there's so much stress. And so what we want to do as a church is we want you to understand that Jesus arrived at Christmas to bring us hope, joy, peace, and love. And Jesus can arrive right now in your heart. And for some of you Christians, you begin to lose hope. And hope is something eternal. Hope is something incredible that God has given us. And I understand some of you went through the Thanksgiving holidays and you couldn't be with your family. That tends to make you give up hope. We're looking at Christmas and the numbers are spiking and it looks like we may not get to spend Christmas with our families. And that makes you lose hope. You're, you're hearing all of the, the doom and gloom and all the, the predictions. And, and we may enter a time that schools are back online and the church can only meet online and and that tends to make us give up hope. I understand that. We're back to wearing masks and 50% and all of these things. And, and I understand how that goes. But I want you to see something incredible in, during this season. I want you to understand that how Jesus can bring us hope in the middle of everything. And 2020 may have kicked you in the backside. But it's going to get better. We have hope. We have hope. We're going to see today that we have hope in a promise. We have hope in a person. And because we have that hope, God is going to come through with us. We need to live in that hope and understand that hope. It's coming. Now, some of you, you understand hope because you're hoping for a vaccine. You're hoping to get to travel again. You're hoping to get rid of that mask forever. I get it. We're all hoping for something. But you see, the hope that we have is not just in something that we hope is going to happen. We have a secure hope in Jesus. And so today, we're going to look at a story, we're going to look at a book in the Old Testament, which doesn't seem very Christmassy at all. But the book of Jeremiah is an incredible book of hope. And the reason it stands out to me, and the reason I wanted to talk to you about it, is Jeremiah was living in a time that makes 2020 look like a birthday party. I mean, if you told Jeremiah your biggest worry was having enough toilet paper for the next three months, he would really laugh at you. Because he is living in a very troubled time. He is living in 587 B.C. In 587 B.C., the nation of Israel is about to fall to the Assyrians. And he is living in a time of intense stress. He is living in a time of hunger. He is living in a time of division. He's living in all of these things to the 10th degree what we are experiencing. But yet he's called the prophet of hope. In fact, he's the prophet when nation of Israel ceased to exist for over 2,000 years, but he's still called the prophet of hope. He's in a prison. He has been disenfranchised. The king has sentenced him to live out his life in a dungeon, and he still writes a book full of hope. And so my thought is, if Jeremiah can have hope in his situation, you and I can have hope in ours. And so I want you to see this book really quickly. First of all, let me introduce you. Jeremiah was a prophet, but he was called at an early age. In fact, he was a teenager when God came to him and said, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So from a young age, Jeremiah knew that God's hand had been placed on him. He knew that he was to proclaim a message. And then he began to see the kind of message that he was to proclaim. Because 40 years later, the place he lives is under siege. Now, in the old war times, what they did is they built these walls around their city. And that was their protection. And Jerusalem was the capital of the southern part of Israel. And so it had a wall built all the way around it. And the armies would go out and fight. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of the Syrians. And he had come down and he began to conquer all of Israel. And as he conquered, they would retreat back to their cities. And now all that's left is the capital of Jerusalem. So King Zedekiah is in his capital and the Assyrians are coming at him. And instead of attacking the walls, they just surround the walls. They surround the walls so nobody can get in and nobody can get out. Now, because of King Hezekiah, earlier there's a water supply inside the city of Jerusalem, so they have plenty of water. The problem is they begin to run out of food. They can't go out and get food. They can't bring food in. They begin to literally starve to death. And the Assyrians sit outside the walls mocking them, eating and feasting and laughing, and the people inside the city are cut off, and they begin to be in desperate, desperate situations. 
So Jeremiah comes, and he's got a word from the Lord to King Zedekiah, and he says, King, it's over. God has found us wanting. For many generations, we have committed spiritual adultery. This is not a military thing. This is a spiritual thing. God told us that if we will, then he will. We didn't keep up our part. And so now the Assyrians are going to overrun us. You can do it the easy way, or you can do it the hard way. Well, Zedekiah brings his other advisors in, and the other advisors tell him, Jeremiah's a crackpot. He's always doom and gloom. You don't need to believe him. We're the nation of God. We are God's chosen people. King, we're going to be fine. God is going to come down from heaven. He's going to rescue us. Jeremiah's like, that's not the word I got. The word I got from the Lord. They're just telling you things that you want to hear. The word I got from the Lord is we've been found wanting and we are going to be destroyed and go into exile. And if you want to save these people, you need to surrender. So what happens? The king listens to the people he wants to listen to and he sends Jeremiah into the dungeon, into the prison. So Jeremiah is in this horrible place, in this prison. He has been ridiculed, humiliated, shunned. He's laying here with the Word of God in his mouth, and he is writing a book during this time, and the book centers on hope. So how is that? How is that that he's hoping? Now, the things get so rough in Jerusalem that if you read the, the historical records outside the Bible, the people of Israel, God's chosen, had turned to cannibalism because the king wouldn't surrender. So they begin to actually eat each other to try to stay alive. Can you imagine the desperation in this place? They knew how unholy that was. They knew how horrible it was. It was just against everything in them, but they actually reverted to cannibalism to try to stay alive. It was that desperate. Jeremiah's writing about hope. Jeremiah would have loved to live in 2020. What an exciting time for him. What a time of abundance. What a time of blessing. But even in those dire situations that he is in, he's talking about hope. And I want you to see why he's talking about hope. Because first of all, he is explaining and understands that hope is in a promise. God had told him in his prophecies, a day is coming that Israel will be safe. A day is coming that Jerusalem will live in peace. A day is coming that I will bring all of the exiled back into Jerusalem and they will live under a righteous king and he will be the Lord's savior and you will have a wonderful, the best days are ahead. There's a promise. So while they're reverting to cannibalism and he's laying in a dungeon, starving of course, he dreams of the promise that he's received. Now, he can understand this promise because it's coming from God himself. You see, once again, a promise is only good as the person giving it, right? And so he knows that God is faithful and God has called him from the, a young age and knew him before he was even in the womb. He trusts that he has a loving God, and that's how we get through our crisis. That's how we get through our problems. That's how we have hope. We know that we have a loving God that loved us and calls us and is there for us, and he promises that the days will get what? Better. That's a promise. Now, that hope is not just a promise. It's a person. See, because for me and you, we know who Jeremiah was looking forward to. We know that righteous judge. We know that Lord Savior because we have seen Jesus Christ. We're on the other side of the cross, and we know Jesus is a person that we can trust, a person that loves us, that came for us, and we understand that. And because we have Jesus, our hope is not just in the future. Our hope is today. I want you to hear that. Jeremiah would have loved to live in a time that the Spirit of God could speak to him and everyone individually. We have an incredible opportunity to be in Christ and to let him come into our hearts and with that second perspective of the Advent to allow him into us this person, this hope. Jeremiah wrote it this way. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. 587 years before we celebrate the first arrival of Jesus in the manger. 
Jeremiah is saying, out of the branch of Jesse, out of the branch of Jesse, you know that Jesus is that branch. You know Jesus is a descendant of David. And he sits on the throne, and he was looking forward to that day. And I want you to understand this person of hope is alive today, ready to come into your life, to enter your life in this troubled time. And then when we place that hope, guess what? It changes us in the present. Now, hope is about a promise and a person. The last part of the definition, though, is it changes who we are right now. It changes who we are right now. When we live our life with hope, it changes who we are right now. We don't get caught up in the controversy. We don't get caught up in the bedlam. We don't get caught up in the division. We understand that we have a hope in something else, and that hope lives inside of us, and we live in such a way that it changes who we are right now. Now, I want to tell you, I want to be just totally honest with you. Hope will ruin your life. It'll ruin it. It's so much easier to be hopeless. Because when you're hopeless, you're not disappointed. When you're hopeless, you don't have anything to look forward to. You just are hopeless. But when you have hope, you start longing. You start looking forward. You start anticipating. You start wanting something else. Hopelessness closes the human heart. But when you hope, you become vulnerable. Hope is incredible. Hope will turn your life upside down. Hope will change you. When you open your heart to Jesus Christ, you're living in your best days, and there are better days to come. The hope of Jesus means we can go through all of these things that we are facing. Some of you have lost your hope. And my prayer is during this Advent season, that hope arrives again in your heart, and you begin to understand who we are. For some of you in the room, for some of you listening online, you haven't received that hope. You haven't asked Jesus into your heart. You don't understand this hope that springs up in us that no matter what we're going through, Jesus is there. Next week, we're going to talk about joy. Joy is something inside of us, not based on our circumstances. The same with hope we have these days. But I want to tell you, hope brings a risk because we need to live in the hope right now. I'll give you a beautiful example from Jeremiah. Now, remember, everybody is starving to death in Jerusalem. Everybody is starving. They are about to be defeated. Jeremiah knows that Nebuchadnezzar is going to come in to this land and take them all off to Babylon. He knows this. But he has this hope. There's this promise in the back of his heart that God made him that one day I'm going to bring you back and you're going to live in Jerusalem in peace and safety. That's a promise. And he trusts that person. So Jeremiah takes a risk. He's laying in prison, and one of his family members comes to him and says, Hey, I got some acres that I'd like to sell you. Now, wait a minute. I've got land I want to sell you? I mean, what kind of scam is this? That sounds like a great deal for the guy getting rid of the land. It's about to be occupied by a foreign country. We're going to be exiled, but hey, I'd like to make you a deal on some land. But you know what Jeremiah does? He buys it. He buys it. He's like, I trust God. I know the better days are coming. There's going to be a time that we're going to come back to Jerusalem, and I'm going to own that piece of land for my family. It's a risk, right? Today, when you're faced with all of the things that you're faced with and and the doom and gloom and the the problems and, and the division, you need to have the same hope Jeremiah has. You need to take a risk and say, you know what? I trust God. I trust God that we're going to come out on the other side of this. I trust God that better days are ahead. I trust God that he's in control. Now, most of you church folks, you love to quote a passage from Jeremiah. And many of you, I know, have it memorized. For those of you that haven't been in church a long time, let let me read this quote that people love to quote. In Jeremiah 29, 11, Jeremiah says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And oh, we love quoting that. We quote it over our children. Oh, God wants to give you a hope. He wants to give you a future. It's going to be incredible. You know what the incredible future is when Jeremiah is writing this? 70 years in exile. 70 years, they've starved, they've been defeated, they've been drug away to Babylon, and they're living in a foreign land. And Jeremiah says, I am, God says, I give you hope. 
So while you're in exile, hold on to that hope. While you're stuck, while you're in a bad place, while you're going through incredible pain, while you're going through sickness, while you're going through the death of a loved one, while you're going through divorce, while you're going through alcoholism, while you're going through all of these horrible things, there's hope. God is there. I'm going to give you a future. Just take a step toward it. As we enter the Christmas season, we may go into another lockdown. Schools may be virtual again. And the church may not be able to meet. But we still have hope. We still have hope. Where do you place your hope? Is your hope centered in the person of Christ? Or is it centered in something else? As you've grown as a Christian, has your hope expanded? Or is it diminished? What are you willing to risk because of who Jesus is? because of what he's done. It's easy to sink into hopelessness. But hear me, there's a better way. I want you to step into hope like this young lady's story you're about to hear. I want you to hear her story of how in a hopeless situation, God had a plan to give her a future. Watch this. come from a, a, a childhood of, of trauma, of rejection. There wasn't a lot of affection. I don't remember many I love yous in the home. My father uh, was an alcoholic and um, beat my mom for all 17 years before he walked out on our family. So that and then the sexual abuse uh, that, I, that I experienced, all that um, kind of led to this toxic shame feeling like um, that I deserved the bad things that um, not that I made a mistake but that I am a mistake and that led to some pretty destructive coping habits growing up it was hard like I remember being a sixth and seventh grader that that's when the cutting started that's when me hating my really hating my life if I can be transparent I remember speaking these words over me I hate me um I'm no good, I'm ugly, I'm stupid. I remember speaking that, just the negative thoughts over myself. We went to church some, but you could tell looking at our home, Jesus was not the king of our home. He was not the king of my heart, so I didn't accept Jesus until um, in my 20s. The low self-worth, I think the looking for acceptance, the looking for affection, looking for love, um, trying to fill a void in my life, that that, contributed to making very poor decisions. In my 20s, I was drinking alcohol heavily. I remember drinking every day after work. I remember behaving inappropriately with men while married. I was one year newlywed and that's when I had that's when I had an affair. And the hatred of myself that the looking for any kind of affection, looking for any kind of acceptance um, was stronger than my vows. And then God had to get my attention from the drinking and the inappropriate behavior with men. It wasn't until he gave me the gift of pregnancy with my son that kind of got my attention, rocked my world. That was the very first time I remember being in my bathroom, crying out to the Lord, God, for the very first time, genuinely, God, I need you. I was dying inside. I was dying inside. <laughs> But I knew where my help, my hope and my help was. And so I continued to give him praise because I knew that he would get me through. It hurt to worship, but I had to be there and I had to keep going because I knew only Jesus could restore what was so incredibly broken. Shame is something that I struggled with all my life, 20 years. Shame for my past, shame for the abuse. Um, shame thinking that I had deserved all of that and so now I know that that was just Satan trying to shut me up and honestly it was Satan literally trying to end my life Satan tried to um, keep me down so that I wouldn't proclaim God's goodness because now there's been a shift there's been a change I'm no longer the person that hates herself I feel like now I have a healthy self view that I finally see myself the way God sees me because I know the hope that there is in Jesus and just what God can do if we will just step out and say, 
God, here I am. I need you. I can't do this without you. Um, if we will just be in that place of surrender, then it's amazing what God can do with our lives. He alone sustains my recovery. He alone sustains my sobriety. He alone is the one who gives me faith. So Jesus alone is my hope and he's your hope too. I know you just applauded for the video, but would you help me thank Lucy for being transparent, open, and honest today? It's her husband back there, right? God, shout out! <laughs> Loving her. As we celebrate this hope, we're thankful that Lucy stepped into that hope. And we light this candle today to remember the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Join me in this prayer. God, give us the strength to trust in your promises. You've already fulfilled your promise of the first coming of Jesus. You have proven yourself worthy of our hope. We have no need to doubt you. Thank you that we have a certain hope in you. In Jesus' name. That leads us to the most important arrival that we can think of. Today, those of you listening, those of you online, if you're living in that hopelessness, I want you to step into hope. And you step into hope by accepting and letting Jesus arrive into your heart. The Bible says that he is righteous and we are not, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrated his love for us. For while you were a sinner, while you were alienated, while you were hopeless, God gave his son so that you may have hope. And guess what? Hope doesn't come alone. Hope comes with joy and peace and love and patience and goodness and faithfulness and self-control. It comes with all of these things. So today, you just have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and believe that God raised him from the dead and you will too have this eternal hope. It's a simple prayer, not magic. But from a believing heart, you simply say these words, Father God, I'm a sinner, and I've messed it up. God, I accept your forgiveness. I believe that you came on that Christmas morning. I believe that you lived a perfect life for me. I believe that you died on a cross and rose again. God, I give you all of my life that I understand and know. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer today, you have that hope. We want to know if you are here we want you to tell somebody that you prayed that prayer. If you're online, we want you to email the Avenue Church so we know that you prayed that prayer because there's some exciting days ahead. Because like Jeremiah, no matter where you are today, you can have hope in a better future. You can have a hope in a better today by praying that prayer. Let's stand together. Hope has a name. His name is Jesus, my Savior's cross has set the city free, hope has in name.
What a morning. Before we head out, I wanna let you know in a few, of a few things. In your seat, you're gonna notice some invite cards. We believe that during this Christmas season, more people are open to coming to church by just an invite. And so grab these cards, invite your family, invite your friends, take it to work. We believe God wants to do something special in their life this year. Also, don't forget to get your Advent kits out in the lobby, $5. We're excited to walk through this Advent season with you guys. And then finally, if you are a first time guest, we've got a special gift for you out in the hub, run by there. They will hook you up today. But also we want you to know you're under no obligation to join us on this journey of generosity. But if you're an Avenue, uh, if you call Avenue home, we want you to know, man, we wanna ask you to, to continue to give faithfully. And you can do that in a couple of different ways. You can text Avenue Give to 77977, or you can drop it in the offering box on your way out. Guys, we love y'all. Y'all have an incredible week. We'll see you next week.